Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Lovely. OK, we're going to start the day with an address from Jackie Kelly. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as Grace just said, thank you. My name is Jackie Kelly. I'm the Dean of the School of Health and Social Work here at the University of Hertfordshire. I'm not a paramedic, so, you know, I'm, they've let me in. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not a medic. Um, I'm a nurse by background, and, um, but my responsibility here at the university uh, is to oversee all of our provision within health and social work, and that includes our paramedic uh, programs um, uh, and provision. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome such a vibrant community. The buzz outside was just amazing uh, to listen to everybody um, you know, catching up, exchanging ideas um, in what is a fantastic um, showcase event today. A um, couple of things for me to do is, uh, is one, to welcome you, which I've done. Uh, two, really is just to thank a few key people who have been involved um, in getting this uh, showcase event together, uh, but also um, in getting this project that we're going to talk about and, 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 and focus on today um, together. And, and I've made notes to make sure that I don't miss anybody's names. Um, Matt, obviously, um, a huge thank you uh, to, uh, to Dr. Matthew uh, Snowsill, who is the founder uh, of this whole uh, project, this whole idea um, and, and the driving force behind it. Um, uh, also particular thanks um, to uh, Tracy Nichols who's from the East of England um, Ambulance Service uh, for this particular collaboration and, and I had an opportunity just to say hello to Tracy before I came up to say hi to you um, and we were just saying how this is a real example of collaboration. It's a real example of how you bring together um, uh, communities, uh, you know, a small idea uh, that's born wherever it was born, I'm sure we'll hear more about that, Matt, but, you know, a small idea and how that grows um, and, uh, and, and, you know, collaborating together um, can take something small uh, to be something very, very substantial. So really, really delighted um, that we're here hosting the showcase today. Um, from uh, the other person I need to thank and she, uh, is, is Grace, uh, so Grace Reed, um, who's also been uh, leading on this um, uh, as feedback lead paramedic. Um, and uh, Grace, um, I always share with everybody in every venue that I'm in, uh, is one of our star uh, paramedic uh, team. Uh, she um, is recently part of our paramedic team, but actually is part of our alumni uh, as a, a student here at the university. So I often use Grace as a reference point when I'm talking to new students about the fact they should come to Hertfordshire because they too could do amazing things. Uh, so that's really fantastic. Um, but uh, the whole thing about this project that is really exciting, so um, uh, Grace and, um, uh, and John Talbot, our professional lead in paramedics, uh, came to have a chat with me about the project um, and just share a little bit more about the reflective um, elements of um, um, of the end of this project uh, before the showcase and talked really about how important um, pre-hospital emergency medical feedback has been and I read some of the uh, project uh, evaluations outside and had the opportunity just to read some of the reflections from uh, people who have engaged in it. Um, I said at the start I'm a nurse, I'm also a psychotherapist um, and our bread and butter in psychotherapy is around reflexivity, is around reflection, is about thinking about um, impact, is uh, looking for feedback in terms of you know, how we can make uh, a difference to somebody, uh, to a family, to somebody's lives. And I think that's what this uh, is about. It's really about sharing your experiences, um, sharing expertise in a new, a fresh way uh, to improve the clinical care, improve clinical outcomes, um, but also to support you deal with, you know, you are amazing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of, to be um, in a school where we are delivering paramedic science um, and working with, with our medical uh, colleagues uh, around pushing the boundaries uh, in relation to um, clinical enhancements for patients, for service users receiving services out of hospital. Um, so this is a really exciting initiative uh, and I've been fully supportive and, and, and um, delighted to have an opportunity to speak to you just for a few minutes. I'm not going to delay um, any longer because somebody somewhere will flash something at me that says two minutes any moment now. So I, I said I was going to avoid that. But I just wanted to again just thank you for being here. There she is. Um, to welcome you uh, once more to the University of Hertfordshire. If it's your first visit, please don't make it your last. Um, those of you that have been talking to people around our postgraduate paramedic opportunities, uh, do come back and have further conversations. We'd love to welcome you uh, as part of our student community. So enjoy the showcase event. I had hoped I was going to be able to join you, but unfortunately I'm not going to be able to stay this afternoon. So I look forward to hearing feedback um, on how well it goes. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Me and Matt met at Harlow uh, Hospital and we hope that from one conversation to this massive conference that we're holding here today, 
you will see how we've developed and why everybody is so interested in it. The aim of FEM Feedback is to provide access for pre-hospital clinicians to the knowledge gained after they hand over the care of their patients to a hospital so that they may use this knowledge to develop both themselves and also to help future patients. Or put very simply, FEM Feedback is about learning from patients for patients. I'm often asked, why FEM? Where's FEM come from? I've borrowed this as a, a figure from um, a well-known book within pre-hospital care, but pre-hospital emergency medicine was an inclusive term I wanted to use to illustrate the collaborative nature that's required for the care of patients out in our communities that encompasses things like immediate medical care and paramedicine reflective of our air ambulance and ambulance colleagues who work so hard because it takes a great many colleagues to build a system capable of looking after our patients in the community, delivering them to a hospital setting so that collaboratively we can all be responsible for getting that patient home, hopefully to their families as well as possible. But the reality is that whilst we in the hospital benefit from written documentation and verbal accounts of what was seen and what was done and the rationale for all of those things in the community by our pre-hospital colleagues. And despite us being able to build upon that foundation in a hospital to further propagate that patient's care, it's a real challenge to take the lessons that we've learned through our extra assessments and investigations to then illustrate back to our pre-hospital clinicians why it was that they saw what they saw, why it was that what they did was the right thing or something that can be improved. There was a few cases that made me really ponder this in particular, but I was lucky enough to spend quite a bit of time with our friends from Essex and Hearts Air Ambulance, and I was struck that they kept saying, in terms of feedback, oh, we, just, we never found out that one. And I, and I thought it was very strange, but it really struck me on one particular case when a patient came in critically unwell with our paramedic colleagues. They're pretty sure they had an overwhelming infection somewhere. The blood pressure was in their boots, heart rate was really high. They were incredibly sick and on the verge of death. But for the life of them, they couldn't work out why this patient was unwell. And they left that day not knowing, and I'm pretty sure to this day they still don't know. But all that they missed was a very small sign, a very atypical sign of a very rare disease. There's nothing they could have done for that patient, and yet I felt sorry for them going home that day and wondering what on earth they could have done. And this meant that I approached my supervisor back in autumn 2016 and said, I feel strongly about this and I want to try and change it. And my supervisor was enormously um, you know, supportive and really believed in, that I believed in what I was trying to do. But as soon as I said to him that I feel it's important to do this without consenting patients because it will be too hard and, too, and it will exclude too many people if we need to do that, he quite rightly said to me, I think your major problem will be with information governance. It's our interaction with our information governance team that has allowed us to get to this point in our project. We are, we are subject to very weighty legislation in the UK, and quite rightly, to make sure that we, are, as custodians of confidential patient information, treat that with the respect and the delicacy that it, it deserves. Which means that then having to balance what we're doing against the Data Protection Act and more regular, oh, sorry, more recently, the EU's data, general data protection regulation has meant that we have to be very clear with our legal basis, in my opinion and in the opinion of the information governance team with which I work. In a nutshell, the fundamental problem is how we reconcile a patient's best interests with regard to their important and sacred patient information with the interests of our entire communities and how we provide a service that has learned from as many lessons as possible. And it's easy to be frustrated by this and to see it as an impediment and, and to see it as something that you know, is, is unnecessary because we are healthcare clinicians, we are healthcare professionals, and we don't misuse data. We are pure of heart and we have honorable intentions. But the reality is that we do, as an industry and a healthcare um, a group of organizations, get it wrong sometimes. And even recently, we've seen high profile examples of celebrities who've had their records accessed inappropriately through curiosity and ignorance, as well as, I can assure you, many more data breaches of non-celebrities that happen every year. So 
I knew fundamentally that the project had to be three things. It had to be information governance compliant, had to be beneficial for our staff, and it had to be acceptable to our patients. And only then could I put together a system that could learn from the pre-hospital management of that patient to build upon to care for the patient in hospital and in return reciprocate by providing those learning points and that additional knowledge so that our pre-hospital clinicians could learn in return. And when Matt and I started to speak about this idea, bear in mind Matt had already gone through two to three years of IG compliance, paperwork, ethical approval. He suggested that paramedics should be getting feedback, ambulance clinicians should be getting feedback. And I agreed, but actually also thought, well, we kind of are. I thought, I do find out the patient's outcome when I tap the nurse on the shoulder. The nurse that I handed over to, she'll tell me. And I do find out the patient's outcome if I ask the night turn to go and check, see how Doris is doing in Bay 8 for me. And I do sometimes find out the patient outcome when I bump into the patient in Liddles, which has happened. Successful story, that one. How do we debrief with each other at the moment? Well, I debrief with my crewmate, but every, um, every day I'm working with somebody different, so that debrief varies in its quality. I could debrief en masse to the mess room, and as you can imagine, that debrief is filled with black humour and very little empathy, which is sometimes appropriate. We have trim man practitioners, we have managers, we have friends, we have spouses that we debrief with, sure. But no one and no resource can tell me what happened to my patient, what is the outcome of my treatment, and what can I learn from what I have just done for that patient. So the idea of a feedback system isn't a new one, however it's still not standard practice. And we were trying to figure out the best way to do this in terms of protecting mental well-being and staff. Okay, so let's take a step back from this for a few minutes. And I want us to reflect in the room. I want you to raise your hand if yes or no to certain questions. And the non-clinicians in the room, please just relay these to either personal or professional moments in your life that you can reflect on too. So, Raise your hand if you have made a mistake in the management of a patient that you are aware of. Raise your hand if you have made a mistake in the management of a patient that you are not aware of. Raise your hand if you have been more critical of yourself than your peers have been of you. <laughs> Raise your hand if you feel comfortable praising your own practice. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> and raise your hand if you have had a peer add valuable insight to one of your cases. Definitely. So, with that in mind, perhaps you as the clinician, me as the clinician, shouldn't be the one to receive feedback directly because I'm not going to add the same insight that others may add for me. Does that make us, as the clinician, the best person to receive feedback directly from the hospital? We thought we'd add an extra person to the feedback loop. The debriefer in this loop will be a senior ambulance clinician who will debrief the clinician of the report when it comes back to them. So let me just put this into context and we're going to use Gladys. Gladys is a 90-year-old female with a head injury. A clinician attends Gladys and takes her to the local emergency department. On arrival, the clinician wonders whether actually that patient would have been more appropriate being transferred to a major trauma centre rather than the local emergency department. As a result of that, the clinician can write down the ED number, which is on the patient's stickers. They have the ED number and they can approach the debriefer, which is our senior ambulance clinician. They approach the debriefer and talk about the case. The debriefer can't answer the questions that the clinician wants to know because the debriefer doesn't know that patient. They know the pattern of events, but they don't know that patient. So as a result of that, the debriefer will put forward a request. And the in-hospital FEM feedback team, which at the moment is a team of doctors, will investigate. They will look through that patient's case history 
look through medication reports, look at CT imaging, look at x-rays, and compile it into one neat report directly related to the learning outcomes that the clinician wanted to know. So in this case, did I take this patient to the right location, destination hospital? As a result of that, the feedback report will come back to the debriefer. The debriefer meets with the clinician and they sit down and have a conversation about it. This is so important, not only to allow the clinician to reflect on their practice with somebody who is also medical and also has all of the facts in front of them, but also can help improve how that clinician processes what they're seeing. It may not always be a positive outcome, but for this outcome, let's say Gladys is home and well. The destination hospital would have been the learning outcome, and the debriefer can deliver that. Yes, Gladys did go to the right place. She did have a bleed, but she went to the right place and is now discharged home. The feedback has then been completed. However, the loop needs to continue because we need to know whether the clinician has had value and insight from that report that was written. So we have satisfaction surveys that the clinician then feeds back to the, the in-hospital team. They can then monitor the quality and length of their reports and making sure that their language is appropriate enough for the paramedic scope. So we felt that debrief-led feedback was the only way to ensure staff safety in terms of mental well-being, especially if things don't go quite so right. And knowing then how we wanted to go about doing this and why we wanted to do it in this way, we then set about deciding whether this was appropriate for our patients. And we spoke with our friends in the Princess Alexandra patient panel led by Anne Nutt and also our colleague Shahid and their colleagues who are here today. And we put it to them why we felt it was important to be able to pass this information from our hospitals, which they represent, to the pre-hospital sphere of practice. And why it was important to do this without consenting patients. Because after all, we want to be able to learn from cases that include those who might not be able to consent. For instance, our patients with severe dementia, or our patients with hypoxic brain injury, or those who've had a car accident and have a, a dreadful brain injury. Children, those with delirium, and what about those that we didn't manage to save? We can't consent the deceased. So we spoke with Anne, Shahid, and their colleagues, put it to them, our rationale, and I'm very pleased to say that on behalf of the local population that they represent, they gave us their blessing, both in the spirit in which we wanted to do this, but also the process by which we planned to do it, to go ahead. But in fact, Anne went even further and took this to Shaping Our Lives, a national group of service users and disabled people whom she co-chairs as part of the leadership team. And once again, we were incredibly humbled to receive back from them a letter encouraging us to continue with what we were doing and the way we were doing it. So together, using this evidence from our patients and also our rationale for why we felt this was the most appropriate way to move forward, we made our application. And in April 2018, we received a letter that said, on behalf of the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, we have approval and legal permission to start doing this in a real hospital with real patient data for real clinicians. And all of this with permission to do so without consenting the patient. This was an enormous um, win for us in terms of the legitimacy and validation for why this was important. And the rest of the day, we hope that you can spend seeing how well this, how well we can all benefit as both patients, hospital clinicians, and pre-hospital clinicians from learning from these kind of information. It's important because our clinicians in, in pre-hospital sphere get it right most of the time. And it's, you know what, it's really important they know they're getting it right. Because if they know they're getting it right, they can keep on getting it right. And yes, I acknowledge it doesn't always go to plan. Nobody's perfect, and we all have to learn from mistakes and adverse outcomes. Aviation is held up as a somewhat of a parallel industry when it comes to the importance of organizations learning from adverse events and industries. 
And many of you may be familiar with the so-called miracle on the Hudson where over the skies of New York, a passenger airliner suffered a catastrophic engine failure and ended up having to make an emergency landing in the Hudson River. The captain, Chelsea Sullenberg, reflected some months after this event upon the learning from adverse incidents culture that aviation is lucky in the most part to have. What he said, I think, has real echoes for what we do and why everything we talk about today is important. He said, everything we know in aviation, every rule in the rule book, every procedure that we have, we know because someone somewhere died. We have purchased at great cost lessons literally bought with blood that we have to preserve as institutional knowledge and pass on to succeeding generations. We cannot have, he continues, the moral failure of forgetting these lessons and have to relearn them. Fem feedback is about three things. It's about learning, it's about safety, and it's about well-being. We want to take these principles and the process by which we, we work and we want to enrich the education and well-being of as many clinicians as possible so that they can take this to the patient side, out in the communities, for some of our most vulnerable and unwell patients. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fem Feedback Showcase. I hope you enjoy the day.